Hey everyone, this is DeathClock1637, and I'm just going to do a quick review of uh, Last Epoch after the 1.0 launch. So, um, just to give you some background, I have owned this game for a while. Uh, I, I played it in the very early days and then put it down and then just came back to it for the full 1.0 launch. Um, I know there's some people out there that have played it in the meantime, and they've commented that, you know, it doesn't feel new anymore. Um, and really, they're just looking to uh, fill in the gaps with the newly released content in 1.0 versus 0.9, and that's totally fair. But I'm coming at it from the perspective of, I've heard about it until now, and this is really the first time I'm experiencing the whole thing. So with that out of the way, um, I'm going to pick a few items um, about the game that I think would apply generally to most action RPGs, having played uh, most or all of them so far. Um, I'm going to go through uh, what I think about the campaign, the skills and effects, items and crafting, uh, and then the end game, and then just sort of give some final thoughts. So, uh, as for the campaign, um, if you're a new player coming into this, um, there's a lot of preamble. Uh, the campaign is nine chapters, and what you'll find in looking around is there's a lot of enthusiasm for skipping through the campaign uh, with all your alternate characters, and I can firmly agree that I did not have a good time in the campaign. <laughs> Um, I thought it was a pure waste of time. Uh, as a dialogue skipper, it made it worse because a lot of the uh, narrative is really just delivered through text. Um, they don't give you, you know, some nice eye candy cutscene to watch. They don't try to explain events through through other things in the game, like if you're having a fight. There's not really any, uh, you know, narrative transition most times into the whole thing. Um, and I felt that a lot of the events were disjointed. And, you know, also that the progression of the game didn't really feel meaningful. And it felt like only near the end chapters did they really start adding a consequence to me you know, having trouble through the fights. Um, admittedly, it's part of my problem because I like to just try to go, go, go and solve problems after. So, um, of course, that was partly my fault. So I'll accept that one and uh, take it on the chin for sure. But um, overall, the campaign itself really just lends you some extra time to explore things if you're new, and really just get, you know, your uh, idle slots and your uh, extra passive points, which, which you can always go back for. So really out of 10, I gave it a one. Um, I thought it was of no extra consequence. Um, the really only big thing that it gives you that can't change is your mastery class. Um, that would be gained around level 15. Um, as you can see on the screen now, you can see the uh, mage I picked and then the rune master mastery. Um, you can respec any of the points you see on the screen here. But if I wanted to change to the sorcerer, which you see more to uh, the left, I could not change that. I'd have to make a new mage completely. So um, that's really the only hurdle in terms of you know, limiting your choices uh, that I would say exists in this game. So again, uh, campaign, didn't like it, um, wouldn't suggest it, and if you can skip it or find some preamble to do it faster, I would suggest going that route. Um, skills and effects. Um, I thought they were pretty cool. I mean, you've been watching this video of me playing Last Epoch in the endgame. I'm sure you can agree, really neat. Items and crafting. Um, a huge upside to this game is that 
It has uh, a game guide in it, and it also has the item, sorry, the loot filter built in to the main menu. So you can actually pull one from a guide or make one yourself. And how it works is in a hierarchy. So if you wanted to filter out all uh, normal rare and blue items, but you wanted certain things to show up prior to the game checking for that, you would have to put that you know, three condition filter of, okay, now don't show me all the white, blue, and rare items at the bottom. So that what that results in is if it finds something, it will stop and then show you the item there and then move on to the next condition while not, you know, filtering out too much. Um, the items themselves pretty neat uh very typical of any action rpg um you know they have prefixes and suffixes um in general it seems like rare items have two and two uh in path of exile you have three and three of each just by comparison um this game allows you to modify your items in a better way than diablo 4 and how they do it is through materials that you find in the game, and it explains what they do when you find them. So there's not really much of a reason for me to go through it. Uh, as for the items themselves, there are six qualities. I talked about uh, three of them, normal, magic, and rare. Um, the next ones you'll find are exalted items, and then unique items, and then legendary items. So. What are these? Exalted items are basically items that pull from uh, a different pool of affixes that are drop only. So you can only access these through things that drop in the world as you're playing. They're not craftable by you and you can't like buy them from a vendor, for example, and they'll show up as purple items. After that is unique. So that's your basic, you know, Unique tier, anything that you find, like boots, you know, weapons, whatever. And then through a crafting system, what you can do is take an exalted item and take a unique item, smash them together and make a legendary. And then that's the only way you can get legendary items in Last Epoch. Um, how you interact with this system is if you find a unique item it has a chance to have a uh for well not a forging potential that's that's on every item and that allows you to have a certain amount of tries at modifying it so what i'm really going for is uh the mechanic for um uh, unique items and that's called legendary potential so when you find something it has a chance to have Either, to either have legendary potential or not. And if it does, you will see a number from one to four. That number from one to four is what I was referring to when smashing the items. So every exalted item that you combine with a unique has to have four affixes. The legendary potential, if it were four, could take all four affixes and throw it onto that legendary item. A legendary potential of one means that it will pick one of the four affixes and apply it to your legendary. And that's where you're kind of rolling that 25% every time. You can't have an exalted item with only one affix, it won't work. Or three, it won't work. It's always four. And then what you're really banking on is that legendary potential being there once you get to that system. So I'm not going to really uh, commit too much more energy on that. Um, for the items and crafting, uh, I gave that a, a 5 out of 10. Um, I thought it was fine. It is definitely a midpoint. Um, items do have weight in this game, but really they're just means to an end in terms of legendaries. Um... At least in this game, there are stash tabs that are not microtransactions that you can get just with in-game gold 
uh, that give you a lot of capacity to just hoard a lot of stuff <laughs> with the intent of really just using it later on because it's cool. Um, yeah, so the end game. Uh, you've been watching that the whole time. <laughs> Essentially, uh, it's kind of a, a mix of the Diablo 3 Greater Rift system and the synthesis minigame that you could put little tiles together with the memories. Um, but it's a lot closer to Greater Rifts than anything. So essentially, you go into this uh, area called the End of Time. You'll cross in like a bridge into a main island. And then from there, you'll see little pockets or timeline islands that have their own isolated quest lines in them. Um, without getting too much into that, essentially your goal is to progress from the lower level ones uh, from when you're done the game around level 60 to the higher ones of which there are three level 90 areas. You have to do the uh, bosses in all of them in order to finish. And then what happens is you unlock empowered monoliths. So instead of the normal difficulty of what I'm playing currently, you get a legendary version and it goes up to level 100. So from there, that's kind of where everything starts for this end game. Um, that's where a lot of the big items come from. And there's a mechanic that exists to increase the XP you get from monsters and the rewards and things like that called corruption. Um, Again, that's really more of a mechanic you'll want to interact with later. Um, the end game overall, I gave it a 6 out of 10. Um, I thought it was fine, uh, but you know, being that this is the only uh, really end game mechanic and they're kind of asking you to do it twice over, um, kind of was a little bit uh, underwhelming for me. Um, and just as a sidebar, you can see that a couple of exalted items just dropped. <laughs> um, there are plenty of other s systems in the game, um, but this is really it. Um, this is all you're engaging with in the end game. And um, I will say that at least 11th Hour Games is committed to adding more stuff to do because this is suffering uh, sort of the same problem as Diablo 4 in that your character power doesn't really have anywhere else to go after a certain point. And, you know, again, that's probably me just being spoiled by Path of XL and the amount of content that it has and the amount of options, which, you know, obviously it can't compete with 10 years of development, right? Um, this game has been in early access for about five years now. This is year five. Um, they have a very good basis for a game. I think it does have like a lot of potential and a lot of places to go. But um, in terms of myself as, you know, a streamer content creator, this game is fun for like a week. <laughs> um, and then I would sort of move on. Um, it would just be one of those side note games that I come back to maybe every so often um, and just sort of play through, you know, get some, uh, easier gameplay done. And then, you know, I'm pretty much done with the game until the next cycle is what they call it. So anyway, um, yeah, <laughs> it's a, a decent action RPG, um, gives you a lot of choice, a lot of flexibility, but there is that sort of a uh, catch of not being able to fully change out your master class. Um, there's a lot of decent graphics, a lot of stuff to engage with, a lot of interesting uh, boss fights in the end game. And I do want to stress that. Um, and a lot of like cool stuff that happens only at that point. But uh, I would say it, you kind of have to drudge through the campaign the first time and uh, sort of you know, I guess, 
I, I, I guess suffer your way through it. Yeah, let's just go with that. <laughs> um, anyway, I know I have been rambling for a bit at this point, so um, if you want to know whether I recommend this game, yes, I do. Um, I think it's going to be sort of a sigh of relief from uh, things that have been released already. Um, it'll just be that sort of cozy end game experience where you can just sort of like do your thing, uh, have a good time, and it won't be too complicated. So anyway, um, hope you like that review. Uh, this game is only like $35. So even if you play it for a week each cycle, I would say that's entirely worth the price. It's much cheaper than Diablo 4, which, you know, for the moment doesn't have that many options at all. So um, even though I have some criticisms of it, I would still suggest that you buy it and give it a shot. Anyway, uh, that's it for me. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Um, you can find me on Twitch at uh, deathclock1637. Or even on YouTube, uh, I multicast usually, and uh, you can follow me on Twitter at that handle, at DeathClock1637, for updates, and uh, yeah, see you later. Have fun.